Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Alzheimer's disease. It's been in the news recently with the death of country music legend Glenn Campbell. Now, Campbell shared his bat- battle with the disease fairly publicly with a documentary film that included footage of his treatment at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Alzheimer's, unfortunately, is a progressive disease. It gets worse over time, and it affects an estimated 5.5 million people in this country. In Alzheimer's disease, the brain cells degenerate and die, causing a steady decline in memory and mental function. At first, someone with Alzheimer's disease may notice mild confusion and difficulty remembering. Eventually, people with the disease may forget important people in their lives and undergo even dramatic personality changes. No, you never would never forget me, would you, Tracy? Never. <laughs> you know, it's a disease that all of us would like to avoid. Here to, dis- dis- here to discuss Alzheimer's disease is Mayo Clinic neurologist and the director of the Mayo Clinic Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Dr. Ronald Peterson. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Peterson. Always good to have you All on. All right. Thanks very much, Tom and Tracy. We always appreciate an update on the disease called Alzheimer's. And recently, the death of Glenn Campbell, he was a patient, but he was really more than that to you, wasn't he? He really was. I mean, he was a wonderful person, and you can see why people liked him so much over the course of his career. He was genuinely friendly, honest, straightforward, and he was he was fun to be with, even far into the disease. And what Ronald Reagan started by uh, opening the door for people to learn more about Alzheimer's disease, I think um, you could argue that Glenn Campbell has continued that work quite well. Yeah, absolutely, even more so in some respects insofar as not only did he announce the presence of the disease for himself, but then he allowed the filmmakers to chronicle the next 18 months of his life, not knowing what was going to happen as the disease progressed. Uh, Alzheimer's does shorten your lifespan? It does. In general, uh, it's very variable how long a person will live after a diagnosis, but it generally does shorten the life by a few years. And people with Alzheimer's, what ultimately happens? Why do they die? Usually it's a medical complication of the disease rather than the disease itself, meaning that later on in the course of the disease, people may develop difficulty swallowing. That may lead to pneumonia, aspiration blood infections. Sometimes they may get uh, urinary tract infections that go undetected, get into the blood. And you, so usually it's a medical complication. You know, and we talk about Alzheimer's and everybody knows the term. Everybody knows someone who has the disease, but it is in fact a form of dementia. Can you explain the relationship between the two? Sure. Dementia refers to the fact that I'm not remembering, not thinking as well as I formerly did, and it's affecting my daily function. So that's dementia. But dementia could be caused by a variety of conditions, Alzheimer's disease, of course, being the most common, especially in aging. But it could also be caused by multiple strokes, brain tumors, medical problems, medication side effects. A variety of things could cause dementia. But again, if you get somebody, say, in their 70s or 80s, with a gradual progression of forgetfulness uh, impacting their daily activities, most likely that dementia is due to Alzheimer's disease. Is there a time or an age when people are most likely to start recognizing some dementia or Alzheimer's-type symptoms? Well, the disease is really one of aging. So, the say, the modal or the, the average age of a person with Alzheimer's disease is probably late 70s, early 80s. But the onset, we think now, begins maybe years, if not decades, earlier. Um, The symptoms. We're we're all concerned about forgetfulness as we get older, and our memory is not as good as it used to be. And how do you know what's normal part of aging? I mean, I, I remember you saying years and years and years ago that really cognitive decline or mental decline really wasn't a part of normal aging, but we don't believe that anymore, right? I no, mean, no, that's true. I mean, one of the studies that we're doing here at Mayo called the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging is looking at this community as they age normally, and we're seeing cognitive changes over time, not due to Alzheimer's disease, but as a part of aging. Um, is Alzheimer's really uh, increasing, or is it the fact that we're living longer? We're living too long. 
Well, the biggest factor is age. That is, the society is living longer than it did formerly. So that's the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So it really, the fact that we're making progress in cancer, we're making progress in heart disease, stroke, actually means that people are living longer and more susceptible to the effects of Alzheimer's disease. So whereas before they might have died of a heart attack in their late 60s, now they're all around long enough to develop Alzheimer's disease. Exactly. Um, is is there a, a way to determine if you are at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease other than knowing that somebody in your family had it? Well, there are some genetic characteristics, although uh, most of the disease is what's called sporadic, not due to genetic uh, predisposition. But nevertheless, there are what are called ge genetic susceptibility factors. So certain changes in some genes that are quite normal, but when they occur in certain frequencies, actually predispose a person to developing the disease. It, can you figure that out if you have your genome checked? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there are essentially two forms of Alzheimer's disease is truly genetic, which is quite rare. Maybe 1% of all Alzheimer's disease is due to what are called deterministic genes, meaning that if you have this gene, the abnormality in this gene, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, and you usually get it earlier in life, so in your 40s or your 50s. Very dramatic, and in these families, 50% of people throughout the generations have the disease, so it's quite dramatic. But again, that's a rare form. The vast majority of people will have Alzheimer's disease as a function of aging and maybe some of these susceptibility genes. So there's one in particular called apolipoprotein E. Now this is a normal protein. We all have it. It serves as a transport function for us. It transports cholesterol and other fats and lipids around the body. It comes in three varieties, so-called E2, E3, and E4. We inherit one type from mom, one type from dad. So we get all combinations, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, 2, 4, etc. Turns out that if you inherit the 4 variety, your risk is increased over time. Again, with age, but it is increased by maybe 3 or 4 fold over the general population. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to inherit the 4 variety from mom and dad, so you're a 4-4, four, four, then your risk goes up 10 to 14 times over the general population. So these are just risk factors, but they're not deterministic. But having your genome checked isn't going to tell you that. You can do it. It might, like 23andMe, okay? They will, in fact, give you a genetic profile, and they will look at chromosome 19, apple lipoprotein E, are you a 2, 3, or 4, or combinations, and they'll tell you this has a certain statistical predisposition for the disease, but it doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can learn a little bit, but not what right. you really want to know. Exactly. All right, uh, to this point in time, is there any effective treatment for someone with Alzheimer's disease? Well, when we talk about treatments, you can talk about pharmacologic or drug treatments, and you can talk about lifestyle interventions. On the pharmacology side, we have a few drugs on the market that are useful for treating the symptoms, may help stabilize people for a period of time, but they do not affect the underlying disease process. So the disease continues to progress as if you weren't treated with those medications. Nevertheless, we use them because the symptom improvement can be important. On the lifestyle side, we're talking about issues like physical activity, maybe a heart-healthy diet, cognitive activity, staying socially connected in your networks, those factors have been shown to be somewhat protective or helpful in cognitive aging. I don't think they really prevent Alzheimer's disease ultimately, but still, if these factors can modify when you become symptomatic, that's a big deal. All right, we're talking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease <laughs> with Mayo Clinic neurologist Dr. Ronald Peterson. Time for a short break. And when we come back, so we've got some questions that we want to answer. Yes, things like what can be done? Can you slow the process of dem dementia or Alzheimer's? We'll look into the future. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are talking with neurologist and the director of the Mayo Clinic Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Dr. Ronald Peterson. We've talked a little bit in general about the disease. We've talked about the unfortunate death of Dr. Glenn Campbell, Ronald Reagan. You said Dr. Glenn Campbell. Oh, the unfortunate death of Glenn Campbell, also a patient of Dr. Peterson's, uh, Mr. Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan. So now we want to ask you a, a couple of things. What 
what we really know about Alzheimer's disease to date and what the future holds and when we might someday have an effective treatment for this disease. And the first thing I want to ask you about is the report that came out this summer from the National Academies of Sciences, and it was called Preventive Co Preventing Cognitive Decline and Dementia, A Way Forward. And what did you think the highlights of that report were? I think there were three findings that came out of that. One is that there may be an avenue for cognitive training, that is, things you can do with your mind to stay intellectually active and perhaps even develop some techniques for remembering, processing that may be beneficial in the long run. The second factor was elevated blood pressure, particularly elevated blood pressure in midlife. Treating it can not only prevent heart disease and stroke, but may actually have an impact on reducing the likelihood of cognitive impairment as you age. And the third factor was physical exercise, aerobic exercise. And in fact, if you get out there, brisk walking, jogging, swimming, things of that nature, again, may postpone cognitive decline in aging. So uh, expand a little bit on the, on the cognitive training. What, what exactly do you mean by that? Crossword Sudoku? puzzles? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it could be. The, the, the difficulty in this area is that it's a major industry out there. And there are a zillion brain games out there that have not been validated. So the committee had to walk a tightrope there to say what the literature indicated without necessarily endorsing some of these products because we just don't know. So there was one study called the ACTIVE study that the committee looked at quite carefully. And this was a study done over 10 years ago where people were actually given cognitive training, usually in groups, te mnemonic techniques. How do you remember a list of this or a list of that? There were techniques with regard to problem solving and techniques for improving your processing speed, doing multitasking more effectively. Those people were trained. They were tested two, five, and ten years later. And in fact, particularly at two years, maybe five, less so at ten, there was evidence that that training actually persisted throughout the years and made those people more efficient and less likely to experience cognitive decline later. Anything else that could help slow the progression of dementia? We really don't know for sure. We think that these other factors, in fact, again, a heart-healthy diet is a good idea. And clearly managing your vascular risk factors, so blood pressure being the main one. But I think physical exercise, too. I think patients often ask me, I said, you know, if you could do one thing, doctor, what would you tell me to do? And I'd say get out there and walk, run, swim, do something of that nature. I'd rather take a nap. <laughs> and brain help? exercises, yeah, too. Does yeah, does that help at all? <laughs> well, but there is some relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's, isn't there? Absolutely. At an uh, international meeting last month in London, there were several studies reporting that, in fact, people with sleep disorders may have an increased tendency to develop cognitive impairment later in life. Now, you can actually get into a biologic explanation as to how that may relate to Alzheimer's disease. Because it turns out that when people are sleeping at night, and in fact when they get down to the deeper stages of sleep, this amyloid protein, one of the culprits that causes the disease, actually gets cleared from the brain. And to the extent you do not get into those deep stages of sleep, that may impair one's abilities of the brain to clear that protein. So it's theoretical, but it could happen. Well, they said you nap may not be so That's bad. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the right track anyway. So, so where are we? Where are you in your research? What do you expect to happen over the next few years? I mean, this is basically a health care crisis for this country. It is. Um, and, and, and so what do you think is going to happen? Well, I, I think we're, we're steadily trying to develop these new therapies. And I think what's happened in recent years is that our ability to detect the disease in life in people, maybe even when they're cognitively normal, has enhanced our ability to develop therapies. So one of the reasons why the therapies have failed thus far is maybe they're being introduced too late in the process. So we're asking people to already be memory impaired, maybe even have mild dementia, before we start these medications that are meant to alter these underlying proteins in the brain. It's like, I'm going to give you a statin, but I'm going to wait till you have your heart attack. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, no. You should lower your cholesterol 5, 10, 20 years earlier to prevent the heart attack. So that strategy has now filtered into our field such that with this ability to look inside the brain, to look for these proteins through our biomarkers, our imaging tests, our biofluid tests, we now know who's likely to be developing the disease, develop symptoms down the road. 
And the idea now is the earlier we intervene, the more likely we will be able to prevent subsequent cognitive decline. So that's not a blood test you use to figure out whether or not someone has dementia. It's an imaging test. And exactly what do you mean by that? So an imaging test can be done with MRI scans or PET scans. PET scans pick up uh, radioactivity. So, for example, if we're trying to detect one of the amyloid proteins or the tau proteins, the two culprits that cause Alzheimer's disease in a person, we would give an injection of a small amount of radioactive substance that would circulate in the blood, go into the brain, and if you had amyloid plaques in the brain, it would attach to that plaque and then give off a signal, similarly with the tau protein in the brain. So since these are the two defining characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, we can now label somebody's brain as to whether they, these proteins are present. So you think that uh, by detecting these abnormal proteins earlier on, then give the medications that we have that don't have, haven't been all that effective, that maybe they will be more effective. Exactly, exactly. I think that the idea is prevention now rather than treatment after the symptoms have begun. And, and, and what else? Do you think that there will ultimately be a medication for people who have more advanced disease? Do you yes. think you can ever reverse the process? That may be a tall order, but I think we could still uh, halt the process, stop the progression, and maybe improve the symptoms. So while we're trying to prevent the disease, we're also working on drugs that will help with the symptomatic stage of the disease. Reversing it might be a tall order. Not that people aren't trying, but that might be a tall order. One of the strategies, treatment strategies, is to give an antibody into the blood that actually goes into the brain, grabs onto that amyloid, and removes it from the brain. And there's a trial underway right now showing that that may, in fact, be effective. So that is a strategy. Now, whether that's going to improve symptoms, again, is, is another uh, stretch. How do you know if that's working, if you have to wait until the person is deceased to check their brain? How do you know if that's working? Well, Tracy, actually, we don't have to wait now because of these biomarkers, these imaging scans, like I was mentioning with this study. In this particular study, they looked at people who had positive amyloid scans, PET mm -hmm. scans, before treatment, gave them the treatment for 12 months, then scanned them again, and there was less amyloid in the brain after the treatment than there was at the start. Well, how is the mood in, in London? This was an international Alzheimer's uh, meeting. Were people uh, fairly upbeat that you're making some progress in our fight against Alzheimer's, or was it a fairly somber mood at the meeting? Well, there weren't any home runs. You didn't mm -hmm. see any headlines out there that a drug has been found. But in fact, I think the mood is upbeat because we're learning so much about the underlying biology of the disease that these strategies that we've been discussing, I think, are going to be effective. All right. Well, that's good to know because there's five and a half million people who are depending on people like you. Dr. Ronald Peterson, neurologist and the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Mayo Clinic. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Tom and Tracy.